Welcome to Positive Leftist News, where we round up all the best stories you won't hear from mainstream outlets. I'm your host, Mexi, reporting on both the triumphant wins and the progress being made by people coming together and engaging in collective action. So feast your eyes and ears, and here we go. Almost three years since Skylar Williams stepped onto a Caledonia construction site and became the public face of an indigenous land defense movement known as 1492 Land Back Lean, an Ontario judge has ruled that he is a free man. Daryl Porter, a second land defender, was also granted an absolute discharge, and all other charges leveled against Williams had been removed prior to his sentencing. Williams' lawyer was expecting, at best, a conditional charge, and the Crown asked Justice Gethin Edward to give Williams a criminal conviction. Instead, after hearing about Williams' actions in their historical and legal context, Edward granted Williams an absolute discharge, meaning he would receive no criminal conviction, could avoid future prosecution, and has unrestricted access to visiting the land back site. Edwards stated Skylar Williams was carrying out his actions as a land protector in the context of these Haudenosaunee laws. Mr. Williams clearly expressed his view that any further attempts to develop contested lands would be revisited by him. In her expert testimony before Edward, Indigenous lawyer Beverly Jacobs put it succinctly, You call them protesters, we call them protectors of land and territories, for our people and for the future of our children. Reminder to all settlers that land back is nothing to be feared. Make Turtle Island great again. Black liberation fighters are celebrating the news that the longest held political prisoner in the U.S., Rochelle Sinke McGee, who fought behind bars in the 1960s and 70s liberation movement, will be released from prison after 67 years. The Coalition to Free Rochelle McGee wrote, We must be clear that Rochelle has been the main driver of his own release. This release will allow him to spend the rest of his life outside of prison walls with his loved ones. We in the coalition hope that this monumental victory will inspire increased commitment to the release of all of our political prisoners. We reaffirm our support for justice for all political prisoners across the U.S., and we will not give up the fight. Hundreds of volunteers across Atlanta, operating in three shifts daily, are taking on the task of collecting more than 70,000 signatures in 58 days to push for a ballot referendum in November on the construction of the Atlanta Public Safety Training Center, better known as Cop City. They can be seen at farmer's markets, going door to door, in grocery stores and parks. They are posing the question, what would you rather the $67 million of taxpayers' money going towards Cop City be spent on? Thousands of signatures have already been collected. Organizations and individuals are donating resources. There are demonstrations, letters, phone calls and texts pouring into corporate headquarters and Atlanta politicians' offices. There is still a chance that Cop City will never be built as long as the people's resistance holds strong. On July 13th and 14th, 60,000 members of the Korean Health and Medical Workers Union from 140 workplaces across 102 branches held a two-day general strike demanding safe staffing and fair pay. This marked the largest health sector strike since 2004, with over 90% of workers expressing support for the action. Happily, the strikers managed to bring the ministry to the negotiation table. Nasun Jha, president of KHMU, met with Vice Minister of Health and Welfare Park Min So, agreeing that further bargaining would take place in good faith. This gave strikers the necessary assurance to suspend the strike. KHMU stated, the KHMU will continue to fight against and push the government to present a practical and forward-looking solution while joining in genuine dialogue and negotiations. Growing worker actions in Korea are in open defiance of the almost comically neoliberal Yoon government that has been a disaster for the Korean working class. All power to the people. The Teamsters Union has won an incredible UPS contract. Their press release states that the Teamsters reached the most historic tentative agreement for workers in the history of UPS, protecting and rewarding more than 340,000 UPS Teamsters nationwide. The overwhelmingly lucrative contract raises wages for all workers, creates more full-time jobs, and includes dozens of workplace protections and improvements. The UPS Teamsters National Negotiating Committee unanimously endorsed the five-year tentative agreement. Teamsters General President Sean M. O'Brien said rank-and-file UPS Teamsters sacrificed everything to get this country through a pandemic and enabled UPS to reap record-setting profits. Teamster labor moves America. The union went into this fight committed to winning for our members. We demanded the best contract in the history of UPS, and we got it. 
UPS has put $30 billion in new money on the table as a direct result of these negotiations. We've changed the game, battling it out day and night to make sure our members want an agreement that pays strong wages, rewards their labor, and doesn't require a single concession. This contract sets a new standard in the labor movement and raises the bar for all workers. An incredible reminder that the union makes us strong. The Dilemmas of Humanity Pan-African Dialogues to Build Socialism Conference took place in South Africa from the 17th to the 20th of July. Nearly 40 people's movements and organizations from across Africa have gathered to come up with practical steps forward for a united fight against the oppressions of capitalism and imperialism. The event is underpinned by the consensus that capitalism has no solutions for the problems that confront humanity and the question, what is the path that we are going to chart towards socialism? Following from this, a central part of their project was forging concrete strategies to ensure their movements wouldn't be hijacked and divided by NGOs, individuals, and academics, as well as rejecting imperialist attempts to draw the continent into conflict. The task thereafter was focused on building a revolutionary agenda and objectives to mobilize the working class. Kwesi Pratt Jr., the General Secretary of the Socialist Movement of Ghana, said, We will build socialism in Africa. We will build socialism in the world. Socialism will conquer capitalism because it is the only system that can deliver justice. Economic, social, political justice. On July 8th, over 300 California Amazon strikers and their allies met pre-dawn at an Amazon warehouse and truck barn in Boston. With bullhorns blaring, they blocked off multiple gates with moving pickets, immediately preventing multiple Amazon big rigs from delivering to the facility. Almost 100 new supporters joined the action, along with uniformed United parcel workers from across the street who were inspired by the turnout. The strike had been organized simply via text chats without public announcement. From the beginning of the strike to 8 a.m., not one vehicle was able to enter or leave the warehouse. The striking drivers made it clear they would keep coming back until an acceptable contract in the warehouse was won. The strike comes as Amazon is facing a wave of unionization. Keep the pressure on, guys. Remember, the boss needs you. You don't need them. The state of Rajasthan in India passed a bill this month extending social security to gig workers without any debate. The Rajasthan platform-based gig workers registration and welfare bill extends rights to gig workers, including having access to general and specific social security schemes and having an opportunity to be heard for any grievances, among others. Rakshita Swami, who has been working for gig workers welfare, termed it as a historic development. Very welcome news. Hollywood's largest strike in over six decades has now been joined by thousands of actors in an immensely powerful act of solidarity. Screenwriters walked out on the 2nd of May in protest over pay, working conditions, and the industry's use of artificial intelligence. And on Friday the 14th of June, around 160,000 performers stopped work to join the 11,500 members of the Writers Guild of America. By midday on Friday, union members and their supporters gathered outside of the offices of major studios and streaming services in Los Angeles, New York, and other cities. Actors will not appear in major films as big as Avatar and the Gladiator sequel, or even promote movies during the strike. Academy Award winner Susan Sarandon told the BBC from a picket line in New York, AI will affect everybody. If it isn't solved now, how do we ever solve it in the future? If you don't have the foresight to put something in place for the future, then you're screwed. It's clear that nothing is going to change from the top down. It's going to be up to us at the bottom. Will Barbenheimer be the last Hollywood movie ever? Stay tuned to PLN to find out. On Saturday, the 15th of July, air transport unions in Italy went ahead with the planned two-day strike, which led to 133 flight cancellations impacting 270,000 travelers. Striking workers included pilots, flight attendants, baggage handlers, and airport personnel. Strikers are demanding a new collective contract six years after the previous one expired. Labor unions said they called the strike over absolutely unsatisfactory contract disagreements with the parent company, Malta Air. What will come of the strikes remains to be seen, but airline strikes are usually disruptive enough to get results. Since June 1st, around 200 members of the York Southwestern Tenants Union in Toronto have mobilized a rent strike in response to yet another above-guideline rent increase that will be ongoing until they reach an agreement with the landlord. Tenants are already dealing with the cost of living crisis alongside stagnant wages and an average cost of rent of $2,500 for a one-bedroom apartment. Some tenants are already foregoing food to pay for rent. Beverly Henry, a senior living on fixed income, worries she will end up homeless. I have nowhere else to go, she says. Mobilizing that many people to stop paying rent is no small feat due to fear of eviction, but there is strength in numbers. The landlords can't evict everyone, demonstrating the power of collective action. 
PLM will keep on top of the story as it develops. The last two non-union casinos remaining on the Las Vegas Strip, Venetian and Palazzo, have struck a deal with the culinary union that will enable non-gaming employees to unionize while managers remain neutral and respect their decision. The culinary union released a statement that read, As union organizers continue to have conversations with workers at the Venetian and Palazzo, we are respectfully listening to what is important to workers, what they would like to preserve, and if there are improvements they would like to see implemented. This ends a decades-long standoff between Las Vegas' largest unions and Venetian and Palazzo's management. Combined, the Venetian and Palazzo have some 8,000 gaming and non-gaming workers who now have powerful leverage in securing better working conditions and pay. The International Workers of the World Escape Room Workers' Union is now organizing in several escape rooms across the UK in protest against poor health and safety conditions, low pay, and little time for breaks. In a statement on their website, the ERWU wrote, The working class and the employing class have nothing in common. We want our grievances to be listened to, for our labor to be fairly rewarded, and for the escape rooms across the industry to maintain a high standard for safety and workers' rights. Rather than quitting, which is the only suggestion made by our bosses, we have instead chosen to form a union and fight for changes together. The ERWU invited all escape room workers to follow their example and join them in the union. Their contact information will be provided in the show notes. On June 23rd, hundreds of same-sex couples and transgender people in Mexico City came together in a mass ceremony to celebrate same-sex weddings and the completion of administrative processes to allow folks to change their genders. Approximately 120 couples met the requirements to get married under the banner of Hand in Hand, We March with Pride. One groom, Edgar Mendoza, expressed his gratitude for finally being able to marry after 10 years with his partner. This is a very important document, more than a piece of paper or a symbol of marriage. It is security that I can give to my family. Nepal's Supreme Court has ordered the government to begin registering LGBT marriages, effectively legalizing same-sex marriage. This breakthrough moment came about after seven people, including activist Pinky Gurung, representing the Blue Diamond Society, an organization advocating for LGBTI rights, filed a writ to the Prime Minister and the Office of the Council of Ministers, calling for the legalization of same-sex marriage. The writ invoked the Constitution of Nepal, which guarantees both the freedom to marry for all individuals and that all citizens are equal under the law. Sounds like a very strong constitutional argument. Congratulations to LGBTQ folks in Nepal. A Scottish trans woman has been cleared of all charges after posting an alleged threatening tweet about transphobic politician Edinburgh MP Joanna Cherry, which said, SDG, swear to God, I'm gonna pop Joanna Cherry. <laughs> Following the evidence, Sheriff Ian Anderson said this was a very unwise message that no doubt caused a great deal of concern. But I have some doubt, reasonable doubt, as to your guilt in the matter, so you are therefore acquitted and I find you not guilty. Joe Cherry is a transphobic member of parliament who has a bad habit of suing people anytime they say anything bad about her. She previously threatened to sue the Stan Comedy Club for refusing to platform her. Not this time, Joe. Trans rights are human rights. In late June, young activists from Ghana and Lesotho took to the streets to protest the sexist taxation of menstrual hygiene products in their nations. Organized by the Women's Wing of the Socialist Movement of Ghana and other organizations, the action aimed to draw attention to the overlooked issue of period poverty. In Accra, Ghana's capital, protesters marched to Parliament where the Speaker of the House paused the ongoing session to meet with the marchers and hear their demands. Speaker Albin Bagbin assured the protesters that their voices were heard and to expect a positive response from the government. Being experienced activists, the women's wing of the socialist movement of Ghana vowed to return to the streets if the speaker does not make good on his word. China is on track to nearly double its wind and solar capacity and surpass Xi's clean power goal five years ahead of schedule. China has installed a record number of solar panels in the past two years, and wind and solar projects are set to reach 1,371 gigawatts by 2025. While coal is still China's main energy source, its shift toward renewable energy outpaces every other nation. For more than a decade, China has been the world's fastest growing producer of renewable energy with no sign of slowing down. This is very welcome news for the global climate. My friends, if you have good news from the current month, please send your stories to mexi at protonmail.com. Thank you to Javi for the positive news jams. Thank you to Cosmo for the positive news background. To Catherine, Mexi, and Marshall for script writing, production, and hosting. And thank you to Tristan for editing this video. If you'd like to support the show, please go to patreon.com slash positive leftist news, or you can give us a one-time tip via PayPal. The link is in the description box below. Yeah, come on. 
sometimes. 